It's great to be part of this panel uh, in the context of like talking about like spatial history and um, and I mean architecture and urban space is really where the uh, my area of research and things that I love. And I guess I'd like to contribute a part, uh, my part into it, uh, in terms of uh, this embedded aspect in also in the built environment. Uh, so this is a, a image of the Chunwan New Town uh, in uh, early '80s. Uh, with I think there's a footwork train is in the background. Um, and then uh, the, I think that's a public school uh, in the middle. And then in the foreground, that's actually uh, the uh, uh, Chunwan uh, Town Hall. Uh, so the new towns were built with the goal of having a balanced uh, lifestyle that not only uh, for living and working, but also with uh, leisure. Uh, so therefore, uh, in, in a lot of these new towns, they were planted uh, with uh, amenities uh, such as the um, parks and sports ground, and spell, uh, as well as uh, cultural facilities, and they were called uh, town halls here. So my sharing today will be about these cultural buildings built in the nine, uh, 1980s, more or less around 1980s. Uh, and they were known by different names. Uh, some, of them, they, some places they call it town hall, uh, they call it civil center, uh, or the cultural center. But in essence, they're actually all, uh, can, we can see it collectively as a common type. Uh, I guess this is more familiar term we use in architecture as a common uh, building typology, uh, which uh, has a greater significance uh, as a concept uh, that can uh, propagate uh, rather than the individual architecture object uh, itself. Um, yeah, and then furthermore, uh, uh, in terms of um, uh, cultural development or being a, a cultural amenity, uh, they have the positioning of, uh, instead of being an exclusive palace type of uh, place of art, uh, the cultural centers actually also has the inherent uh, social purpose as a community space uh, where uh, culture is brought to the public. So with the approach of uh, amenity resource distribution uh, in the town planning, uh, that uh, a dozen of these uh, cultural centers were planned and built uh, in the uh, in the last decades uh, of the colonial rule. Uh, so together with museums and also local libraries, uh, they represent an ambitious uh, development scheme, uh, mostly by the effort of the urban council uh, and later on uh, also uh, with the regional council to bring um, the so-called universal access uh, to cultural activities to uh, all parts of the territory. Uh, so from the map here, we can also see the spatial distribution of these uh, facilities, which are kind of synchronized also with uh, the urban development around that time. So the uh, first and most uh, prominent uh, cultural buildings, the City Hall and the uh, Hong Kong Cultural Center, they're uh, concentrated in the uh, city area uh, right across the Victoria Harbor and then also uh, extended to the so-called urban area, like in uh, Kowloon and then also in Shenwan and Saiwan Hall. Those are the civic centers that were built in the 90s. And then in parallel, uh, there are also the new town development on the much larger area in the north, basically all the other, uh, the concentration of where the new towns are they were also equipped with a town hall, uh, especially in the first three new towns in Chunwan, Sa Ting, and Chunmun. They actually have quite a substantial size town hall. All these municipal centers, they were designed by the architectural office uh, at the Public Works uh, Department and more or less derived uh, from a standard uh, brief. So in a way, this is actually a more uh, technocratic exercise of public building design. So whether it's a school or a cultural center, uh, to uh, some of the architects that we interviewed um, uh, uh, that were working at that time. To them, it's actually the same thing, whether I'm doing uh, yeah, uh, whatever type of building. So with a different uh, idea or concept that as we would usually understand of saying that, oh, wow, cultural building is going to this great architecture work that uh, w with a lot of aesthetic value in there. So it's a little bit different, the, the way of how these uh, cultural centers uh, were built. And then, although there actually wasn't an explicit uh, reference, uh, but the uh, early um, PWD architects uh, were mostly uh, British architects, and uh, they also adopted the uh, UK system of uh, municipal art centers uh, in terms of its planning and design. So this document was from 1946 uh, for uh, planning for art centers proposed by the UK Arts Council. So in their I'm talking about for uh, uh, small towns or for population from uh, 15,000 to 30,000 people, the, the town should be equipped uh, with a municipal art center, uh, with program including an all-purpose auditorium, exhibition space, uh, restaurants, and then also some uh, studio and uh, rehearsal room. 
So that kind of becomes the standard program uh, also, or the standard idea for also for uh, the municipal cultural centers in Hong Kong, uh, but with a much higher uh, density. Uh, so if we take the auditorium size uh, as a benchmark, uh, so we can see like the smaller one, which is uh, comparable actually to the, uh, the UK uh, plan uh, of a 500 people auditorium, it's actually benchmarked for a uh, 100,000 uh, population area. And then uh, with a larger uh, town hall that has uh, more or less like 15,000 uh, seat uh, auditorium, uh, they usually uh, mesh in with the projection of population of, of at least uh, 500,000. Uh, so with this uh, rational amenity planning approach uh, to decide where the uh, resource uh, distribution, uh, it, again, it's actually based on uh, the growth of the, of the district uh, prior to any um, artistic or cultural con uh, consideration. And uh, therefore, we call this uh, the, the common type. Uh, the common type is a product of this pr uh, pragmatic solution, basically to fulfill uh, the building program in the most uh, cost-effective and then most uh, efficient manner. And they're also kind of, therefore, known to be like architecturally unattractive. All of them kind of look the same. Even though nowadays with the revival of like brutalist architecture, we have some uh, new uh, understanding or new appreciation of them. But anyway, so the core program uh, for these uh, common type, this uh, cultural center type is the auditorium. Uh, and they actually serve for both uh, professional uh, and also like amateur, more like a community type uh, of performance. And therefore the important part of it actually to, uh, are to uh, fulfill uh, so-called local needs uh, with a number of seminar rooms, uh, with rehearsal studio, and so on. Uh, so the first one was the uh, Chumwan uh, Town Center, uh, Chumwan Town Hall, uh, built in 1980. Uh, and then the later, uh, later Art the Local District uh, saw them having their own town hall. said, oh, we want one too. So this is actually by the efficacy from the uh, local district councils. And later on uh, in 1987, uh, Satin and Timur both uh, have their own town hall. And uh, so the, the uh, town hall was basically answering to the local demand of, oh, we need a, a community space, we need a community hall, and they want something very quick. And that was the uh, demand from the uh, Chimwan uh, uh, District Council. That, well, we want something in like two to three years. I don't want to wait 10 years for, for, for a building. Uh, and I guess the only way, like when the uh, uh, Urban Council and also uh, the architects, and they were thinking about, well, I guess the only way that they can do is actually to adopt uh, existing design. And I guess at that time, the only uh, um, cultural center type of this type of facility built uh, is the City Hall uh, in uh, Central. So therefore, uh, the City Hall, which opened in 1962 uh, as the first modern uh, uh, integrated uh, public facility for culture uh, kind of becomes the archetype, becomes the standard for many of these uh, cultural centers uh, to follow. And then if we see here, uh, the uh, architectural plan was almost directly adopted from the City Hall, Concert Hall, and copied to the Chinwan Town Hall. And at that point, there was actually a note on that drawing that was saying that like all the pushaded area just adopt directly. And we don't have to do that part of work. It is literally there. And of course, to save time on design and also preparation uh, for the construction document. Um, and uh, I guess uh, looking into a little bit more uh, of the uh, history at that time uh, for the uh, architectural office, uh, it was really, uh, they were actually really at a high demand. So again, like with one of the architects that I talked with uh, who was working uh, in the AO at that time, they were saying they were basically a factory. So the easiest way, uh, because at that time they still actually have to draw every plan by hand. So that makes it even more important that it can be uh, you know, like copied directly so you can actually send it to a junior and actually get it done. Literally a factory, that's what they say. Um, and therefore, uh, the architectural production of the common type uh, is a pragmatic operation instead of a creative invention. And then there were uh, usually like minimal iteration uh, to the site condition. And other part that they adopt uh, from the UK or the larger like European cultural center uh, concept was actually diverting from the European version of the cultural center, which actually 
Uh, that time they see uh, cultural participation as a form of like activating uh, citizenship, uh, political empowerment, and all that. But then uh, at that time, putting into the context of uh, uh, Hong Kong in the 60s and 70s, it was considered a quite sensitive issue by uh, the late colonial government. So instead of uh, talking about empowerment and citizenship, uh, they emphasize on the rhetoric of uh, community building and of course strategically avoiding any political or ideological reference uh, through uh, cultural representation, cultural activities. Um, and it also actually have another pragmatic function uh, because at the time of the, especially on the new town uh, development, but also in the urban district regeneration as well, uh, that uh, there, there were, uh, you know, conflicts about uh, resettlement and all that. So this is also um, on a place that I want to build the uh, uh, impression of uh, uh, community activities uh, and and uh, a nice, happy scene. Anyway, so, but under uh, this uh, unified system of cultural center, there was actually one uh, exception, uh, that is the uh, Hong Kong Cultural Center. So uh, situated in the center of Kowloon with increasing population, uh, it was originally planned uh, as the uh, Kowloon Civic Center. So put that, uh, put it in the same category uh, as the other town halls. And then also uh, it was a standard program uh, as a town hall as well. But for its location at the Timsatra waterfront uh, and then uh, the growing ambition uh, of the Urban Council uh, since its organizational reform in 1973, uh, it gradually rises to status um, in, as a uh, new cultural landmark uh, for the whole Hong Kong um, and renamed as the Hong Kong Cultural Center in the early 80s. Uh, so therefore, it actually become an exception uh, out of the uh, common type. So for the Hong Kong Cultural Center, the scope and the program uh, began from uh, the district, cultural, uh, district uh, civic center has expanded into a much larger uh, cultural comp uh, complex and consists of uh, four components which have their, kind of have their history of where they come from. So the uh, auditoria building, which is now known as the Hong Kong Cultural Center itself, with the uh, concert hall, with the theater and the studio theater, those were the original brief uh, for the Kowloon Civic Center. And then there was a, a planetarium. That was the first one completed uh, in 1980. That was a prior approved program, uh, even before uh, the whole cultural complex was conceived. And then the Museum of Art was originally uh, expansion plan uh, for the City Hall uh, Museum. And then finally, the public garden, which was in the original master plan of the area, that was a, a part of the requirement. But all of these together uh, becomes this much larger endeavor uh, as the cultural center uh, or the cultural complex at that time. Unlike the factory production that we were talking about, like with the nominal uh, uh, public building, uh, the Hong Kong Culture Center was definitely given uh, special attention uh, during its design process. And uh, well, it was designed by uh, the senior uh, government architect, Jose Lai, who actually became uh, the uh, director of the um, architecture service department. And then in, in an interview, um, from that time, he, uh, he recorded that uh, as, as a uh, commission of a lifetime. And then, uh, although it, it actually started with uh, the standard program uh, of the generic component, um, but also through his acquaintances uh, with the Urban Council chairman, he recognized uh, the significance of this project is way beyond uh, any of those uh, cultural centers and would actually require a memorable form and image. So it carries the amb ambition uh, of becoming the landmark of the aspir aspiring global city and often uh, compared with or benchmarked to uh, the world publicized uh, city Sydney Opera House, which was um, opened around uh, that time. And then of course, in, for its opening uh, in 1989, November, it was a spectacular event uh, with the visit of then Prince Charles, now King Charles, uh, and then uh, Prince Diana at that time. Uh, and then also the urban council, well, actually in the larger council uh, that, that they tried to solicit like all these international uh, famous artists to come to perform with actually a month long opening festival. And then of course the SEMP uh, the most important newspaper at that time, make a 10-page uh, special supplement to celebrate the occasion. Actually, both in uh, English press and not Chinese press, and actually even uh, New York Times have a half-page half report on it. So marking it uh, actually the most important event uh, in both uh, uh, urban development and cultural development in Hong Kong around that time. And then it was known as, uh, or dubbed as the last gift from the uh, colonial government to the people of Hong Kong. 
And that was the official uh, narrative, but the public actually, uh, it actually has received a lot of complaints uh, and critique, like from the days that it was uh, uh, opened uh, and actually until nowadays. So most of the time, uh, most of the uh, complaints or most of the critique at that time is actually about uh, the acoustic, the seats are not comfortable um, and all that. And then, um, and then I guess uh, the most famous one, even nowadays people still talk about it, uh, is the facade tile, they call it the bathroom tiles. But uh, almost 45 years uh, after its opening, uh, especially now, uh, all the limelight actually falls onto the, the West Kowloon. So I guess uh, the question uh, is that then where does uh, the Hong Kong Cultural Center, where does it stand? Uh, and uh, what kind of role that it will play uh, in Hong Kong's uh, cultural life and even everyday life, or even more so in everyday life. Um, so I guess what I wish to offer here is a different perspective uh, to see uh, this landmark architecture perhaps not exactly as you know, this grand uh, uh, building uh, and focus on its form and symbolism, but shifting it uh, to the focus of it uh, in terms of uh, its space uh, and its use uh, in the urban context. Um, actually, reading back or looking back at like the old uh, drawings and then the design documents, there are actually a lot of like smaller uh, thoughtful parts uh, that was embedded um, in the building itself. But I probably won't have time to go through uh, all the details uh, of it right now. Um, but I guess one of the thing is that uh, the, in the original design concept, uh, they actually emphasize, they talk about a lot uh, on uh, creating uh, public space. Uh, and then that was also a little bit in, uh, uh, against like, you know, the, the concept of um, how uh, the, the city hall was built at that time, but it was also being critiqued as a, uh, as a very elitist uh, type of uh, place and therefore, uh, in the design of the cultural center and in the strategies, I think both on the uh, delineation of the atrium. I mean, of course, you still have the element with the chandelier and then with the grand uh, mural. But to talk about like the facade material, that they intentionally bring the facade material uh, into the atrium. That was also part of wanting to make it already at that time into an interior public plaza. And then I also with the uh, uh, terrace uh, space outdoor, and in also the convey like a very uh, civic quality, uh, and then to be used by uh, citizens, whether they are cultural uh, audience uh, or not. Um, yeah, so nowadays the atrium become a passage uh, through the waterfront, and I guess many of us actually do that uh, to go through a Guolang hole with a little bit of AC, yeah. And then, or uh, nowadays even more so, that was a, a renovation in 2000, for uh, 2014, that adding all this new sitting area here. So I think more and more we actually see people that will basically just go there and, you know, sit and take a rest. And then also in the terrace area, in the weekends, there were also uh, the uh, domestic workers uh, that they would also uh, like to go there a little bit more uh, quiet than central. So the uh, Hong Kong Cultural Center is no doubt is a postcard image of the Kowloon uh, waterfront. Um, but after the, uh, so many years, uh, it actually also becomes part of the city uh, that is well used and arguably uh, well loved uh, by the people of Hong Kong. So that kind of opens up uh, yeah, whether you love it or not. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much.